Welcome to our, uh, our, first, uh, our first panel today on um, the human person, fundamentals of Catholic social thought. We have uh, two presenters today. Uh, the first is um, Bishop Marcelo Sanchez Sarando. He's the tit titular Bishop of the Forum Novum and Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Sciences and the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences. He received his doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical University of St. Thomas Aquinas, Angelicum in Rome, and has taught the history of philosophy at the Lateran University in Rome and at the Libera Universita Maria um, St. Assunta. He has written extensively in the areas of theology and philosophy. And he'll be followed by uh, Joe Kaboski, who's the David and Aaron M. Singh Foundation Associate Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics at the University of Notre Dame. His research focuses on growth, development, and international economics. In 2012, he was awarded the prestigious Frisch Medal for the best paper in the journal Econometrica, and has published scholarly articles in many other journals, including the American Economic Review and the Journal of Economic Theory. So please uh, welcome His Excellency um, Marcelo Sanchez Sarando. Thank you, Riel, and uh, for your very kind reception here. At the end of his laborious journey in the labyrinth of the transcendental eye, his critic of poor reason can confess with the frankness of a, an ancient stoic to the deep feeling of expectation, he said. The world interests of reason, both speculative and practical, is centered in the three following questions. What can I know? What should I do? Why may I hope? And taking up these questions again in his letter logic, he added as the four question, what is man? In ultimate terms, he added, and his clarification was new and of an essential value, he said. All of these answers could be attributed to anthropological because the first three questions are related to the last, namely, what is man? This question may anthropology the privileged place for the search for truth and may can one of the most radical and brilliant thinkers and at the same time one of the most problematic. The laborious analysis of the critic, the Rainer Bernouf, which Kant wanted to categorize as metaphysical, led to him being lost in a labyrinth which end with more questions than answers. However, he does not surrender, but appeals probably under the influence of Hume, notion of feeling, which gave vitality and value to impressions, to profound conviction, Kant right, and experience. And he managed to state the very famous text of the, of the conclusion of the critic of the practicum Pernouf. Two things fill my spirit with an ever new and increasing admiration and veneration. The more my reflections increase, the starry sky above me, and the moral law inside me. He has not uncertain undoed, he said. I see them both before me, and I connected them immediately with the consciousness of my existence. Two fundamental experiences and two paths of openness to the infinite, each one with the same anthropological point of the path, but with different direction that have become today with the development of the contemporary physics astrophysics, biology, neurology, of particular significance and contemporary relevance. Can explain all of this after 
what he himself called the revolution in physics of Copernicus and Galileo. We will now go over what Kant suggested to us. Two fundamental experience of openness to the infinite. The first pathway, he explained, begins with the, pla the place that I occupy with my body and brain in the sensible external world and enlarge the connection in which I find myself in, he said, an unending greatest with wall after wall and system after system and ever more in the unlimited times of their periodic movement, their beginning and their duration. This experience is the pathway of reflection of nature which leads the spirit admired and lost, but nonetheless prove of its awareness of the infinite, beyond the horizon of the visible world. The second pathway, namely the experience of the moral law, begins with, say Kant, my invisible, that is to say, from my consciousness of my personhood and represent me in a world which has, and here the point should be stressed, he say, true infinitude, true infinitude, but which only the intellect can penetrate and by which, and thus also at the same time as all these visible worlds, I know myself in a connection, not as is the case there in the experience of the starry sky above me, which is simply accidental, but rather, in this case, which is universal and necessary existence. In the human being, the point of intersection between the two experiences or spectacles, however, you wish to call them is shrinking and revealing the true infinite, allowed by participation of the human spirit, that is to say, of the intellective soul at its center. The first experience opens to the transcendence. I don't want to, uh, I, I give my text, and you can read more in details, in the contrary, we don't have time to the discussion. But what is the conclusion of these two experiences? I, I, we can say that the conclusion is that we have today two objective levels of knowledge. It follows from these two spectacular experience that man's knowledge is not a matter of single plane or level, that of the external observation, explanation, and experimentation, also economic, which is the pathway of modern sciences. This knowledge develops in the interface between the natural observation of science and the reflective understanding of philosophy. The human being is simultaneously an observable being, like all the beings of nature in which he participates, and a being who interprets himself, who knows himself, as Heraclitus and later Socrates had already suggested, a self-interpreting being to employ the definition of Charles Taylor or Poirier. This statement of these two objective levels of knowledge that combine in man the one of the external world and the other of the subjective world can provide an answer of reconciliation and pacification to the question of rights by the status of human being in the field of knowledge in the age of the predominance of sciences and also social sciences, along as, that is, 
positive ideology does not claim the right to abolish the border between the science of nature and the science of man and to annex the latter to the former. With this speech, we can reconcile a conflict that connected with the science of genetic mutation of heredity and other conflicts. But I want to speak with this, especially because I think it's the more important. The starting point of natural theology, philosophy, and social sciences. Philosophy, in turn, and not only philosophy, but also social sciences open to the natural sciences, must not engage in a battle which is lost from the outset to establish the natural facts. Philosophy should ask itself how it can find a meeting point with the scientific point of view, starting from the position according to which the human being is already a speaking, questioning being. A human being, therefore, who has given himself some answers that speak of his domain of freedom in relation to given nature. Will the scientists follow the descendant order of species and bring out the uncertain, contingent, and improbable aspect of the result of evolution in man? The philosophers start from the self-interpretation of man's intellectual, moral, and spiritual situation and ascend back through the course of evolution to the source of life and of being that man himself is. The starting point can still be the original question, which has already been latent with a sort of self-referentiality of principle. Moral law for Kant is what makes the difference. Freedom is what Hegel calls the essence of the spirit. The human being, discovery and recognized to himself as moral and free, can legitimately ask himself how he arose from animal nature. Thus, the approach is retrospective and retraces the chain of mutation and variation. This retrospective approach meet the other progressive approach which descend the river of the progeny of the human being, man and woman. The two approaches intersect at a point, the birth of the symbolic and spiritual world where knowledge, moral law, and achieved freedom define the humanity of man. Of course, we can distinguish here two meanings of the term origin. One is the origin horizontal, we can say, and the other is the origin vertical. One is the origin of the nature, and the other is the nature of the being as being. But I don't want to, to read all this part, but only to say that if we accepted this level of philosophy, we can ask for this origin that is not in the perspective of science, but it's in the perspective of knowledge of the human being. And I, I think in this part, the, is all, the, in the end, the meaning of the encyclical Fidesz Ratio is, is just this, is to put the, the problem of the anthropology and the modern uh, develop of the anthropology in a, in a relation with the metaphysical, and uh, of especially of human being. And uh, here, Thomas Aquinas, for me, has the more accurate answer. Because he say, as you know, that the soul, our, uh, the soul of the human spirit, of course, for Thomas Aquinas and for the Greeks, all the living beings have a soul, but only the human being have an immortal soul because it's a substance, subsistent form that is, uh, that is uh, in an special act of being and have a connection, uh, insepar inseparable of, of, with this act of being, 
And this is the interpretation that Thomas Aquinas gave about the, the notion of the human being is image of God. And uh, this is the base of the capability that the human being have to receive the grace of Christ. The statement that can be drawn from this very lovely speculative reflection by St. Thomas is that the dignity of the spirit is characterized by Kant, Hegel, and others, such as with Wittgenstein after the Galilean Revolution in convergence with Thomas Aquinas. In modern truth, through the transcendentality of knowledge, of freedom, of moral law, and of language that have the self as their letter. In Thomas Aquinas, these transcendentalities, like the self as well, are founded in the act of being, and is necessary belonging to the finite spirit is obtained by means of the direct participation of God. Therefore, a single subsistence, as Kierkegaard also showed, has his vertical origin as a creative person. Thus man is capable of God, as is rightly observed in the beginning of the compendium of the Catechism promulgated by Pope Benedict XVI. And uh, this is the base of the possibility to the reception of the grace of Christ. The grace of Christ makes human beings capable of merit. I think this is a very important thesis also for the social life I, I tried to analyze. The human soul, which is a subsistent form inseparable of the act of being, capable of knowing and loving, it is it's a spirit, Although this is a substant form of the body, is intrinsically immortal in the real order of things. This is the metaphysical foundation according to which the human person is in himself free and capable of ethical order and emerge from the force of nature and instinct of the animals. A spiritual subject, the human being is imago Dei and capable of receiving grace, said Thomas Aquinas. And this is the highest status and dignity that human being can reach as a spiritual being. Hence, when the human being, say, Thomas Aquinas, has received grace, he is capable of performing the requested acts for himself and others. And this is the social dimension of the grace that Pope Benedict XVI refers and say that each human being, and this, this is the essence of the social life, say Benedict in his encyclical, that each human being is instrument of grace for the, for the whole human being. It's not only capable of have merit of grace, is also instrument of grace for the other people. And I want to finish, because we can discuss this question, to a conclusion that is, uh, what should the church do in this situation of today? What does the Christian people need in order to conserve itself as such and to perform its function of being light and soul of there, a spiritual, moral animator of time, where providence has destined it to live, in particular during these days. The answer is neither easy nor simple, it's clear, but we can find a summarizing answer in the ancient and new enunciation, which is full of immense meaning and which was proposed by St. Peter. Today, the church, that is to say, the people of God, or rather all of us, or to put in better, every person of faith must repeat to themselves the words that St. Leo the Great take from St. Peter. Agnosce o Christiane dignitatem tua. 
Be aware, Christian, of your dignity. You have been risen to participation of the nature of God. Do not seek to the fall into the lowness of your old prevail. Remember of which head and which mystical body you are member. Think again of your liberation from the power of the showers and you move to the light and the kingdom of God. And this institution, the name is the light of Christ. Thank you.